survive and be asked how they slammed my head against a trestle, how I had to freeze at night, how my hair started to turn grey. But I'll smile and we'll crack some joke and brush away the encroaching shadow and I will render homage to the dry September that became my second birth and I'll be asked, doesn't it hurt you to remember? not being deceived by my outward flippancy. But the former names will detonate in my memory, magnificent as old canon. Yo and others are part of the Keston Library and Archives, housed in the Keston Center on the third floor of Carroll Library. They are also available in Keston's digital collection, should you want to view them. But what is Keston, and why Baylor? The Keston Institute was founded in 1969 by the Reverend Canon Dr. Michael Bordeaux, an Anglican priest. Ten years earlier, while studying at Oxford University, Michael took part in the first student exchange between Great Britain and the Soviet Union. While at Moscow University in 1959, he witnessed the start of Nikita Khrushchev's anti-religious campaign, saw churches forcibly closed, and heard his fellow believers were being persecuted. Later, he received a note from Russian Christians asking for help. And on a 1964 visit to Moscow, Michael learned that a church had been blown up in city center overnight. While peering through the rubble surrounding the with, while peering through the fencing that was surrounding the rubble, a woman realized he was a foreigner and asked him to follow her. Of course, keeping a safe distance, she led Michael to Moscow's outskirts where Russian Orthodox believers had gathered, miraculously including the woman who penned the letter. They told him about the persecution and asked him, quote, to be our voice where we cannot be heard. Thus, Michael took up their call to be the voice of the voiceless. In 1969, Bordeaux with Sir John Lawrence, who himself found a divine note in a Russian hotel under his pillow that read, Help us, believers, and others, including today's speaker, Zania Denon, established Keston College, to make known the needs of all religious believers and to uphold religious freedom in every case. So the mission of Keston was and is to tell the truth, to gather reliable information about the religious situation in the countries of the now former communist bloc and under other totalitarian regimes. Most notably, Keston documented persecution and the fight for dissident believers. A vast library and unique archive formed Keston's core, and the Keston News Service produced authenticated reports that served to exert political pressure. Reports used by the BBC, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, the AP, and others. And the pressure made the difference, including for Irina Ratushinskaya. With the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the end of the Cold War era, Keston experienced a decline in donations. And in 2003, the Keston News Service ceased. Shortly thereafter, the Institute began searching for a location for its stunning collection on religious persecution and religious freedom. Oxford Keston's Institute accepted Baylor's proposal, largely because of Wallace Daniel, who is here with us today. And in, 19, in, in 2007, Keston UK passed its library and archives to the newly created Keston Center at Baylor to work with Keston UK to preserve the resources and promote research, teaching, and understanding of religion under communism and totalitarian societies, and to continue to be the voice of the voiceless, even now. Today's lecture is part of that legacy. English PhD candidate Luke Sayers, who has served as both a Keston summer intern and as a Keston teaching fellow, will introduce today's lecturer. Luke also studied Russian in Kiev, Ukraine during the summer of 2021 and regularly brings his classes to Keston. Luke. Good afternoon, everyone. 
really close? Can you hear? There we go. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Mrs. Zenia Denin, who will speak to us today about the life and work of the Soviet poet and dissident Irina Ratushinskaya, an important topic for us exactly one year today after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Mrs. Denin has extensive experience in the study of religion, communism, Russia, and the post-Soviet world, and she has published widely on these topics. She studied French and Russian at Oxford University, and re she received a graduate degree in Russian politics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. In 1969, she worked with the Reverend Dr. Michael Bordeaux and Sir John Lawrence to establish the Center for the Study of Religion and Communism, which later became the Keston Institute. It would be an understatement to say that Mrs. Denon's contributions to the Keston Institute have been significant. She founded and for a long time edited Keston's academic journal, Religion and Communist Lands, and Keston's magazine, Frontier. And she was instrumental in establishing the Keston Center for Religion, Politics, and Society here at Baylor in 2007. She also acted as Keston Institute's Moscow representative after the collapse of the Soviet Union. As representative, she traveled regularly throughout Russia, establishing connections with scholars and religious leaders, an effort that has culminated in the publication of the monumental Encyclopedia of Religious Life in Russia today. Currently, she serves both as the chairman of the Keston Institute and as editor for the Keston Newsletter. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Zenya Denin. Luke, thank you very much for those very kind words. I should hope I shall be worthy of them. Today, the 24th of February, as you've already heard, marks a year since Russia began its invasion of Ukraine. As I watch in horror the atrocities and appalling suffering inflicted on the Ukrainian people, I start thinking about human despair and how it is that some human beings are able to turn what is death-dealing into something life-affirming. Why do some people survive the horrific conditions of a Nazi concentration camp or a Soviet labor camp and others die quickly? Why does a person not commit suicide? These were questions that the psychotherapist and writer, Dr. Viktor Frankl, who was himself imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp, explored with his patients, and their answers formed the threads that he gradually wove together to create what he called logotherapy, his version of existential analysis. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl explores this subject and comes to the conclusion that those who have a sense of meaning in their lives, who felt their existence was part of a metaphysical framework, were able to survive and even sometimes to demonstrate extraordinary inner strength and human goodness. Simon Weil took up an opposite view. In her essay, The Love of God and Affliction, she claims that extreme human suffering, which she calls affliction, is always dehumanizing and destructive. She wrote that it deprives its victims of their personality and makes them into things. It freezes all those it touches right to the depths of their souls. They will never find warmth again. They will never believe any more that they are anyone. These two diametrically opposed views, the life-affirming and the death-dealing, are illustrated in the form of two figures from literature. The first view through Lucaria, 
a character in the short story, A Living Relic by Ivan Turgenev in his collection, A Sportsman's Sketches. And the second through Gregor in Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis. Gregor endures a terrifying life, imprisoned within the carapace of an unwanted and unloved insect who shrivels up until in death he is no more than a flat piece of shell that is swept up like rubbish and which his family do not even bother to bury. He is totally destroyed. Very different is life-affirming Lucaria, although paralyzed as the result of a fall when very young. She exudes joy and peace. She loves life, loves listening to the pigeons, watching the bees and chickens. Her head, Turgenev writes, looked like an ancient icon. Turgenev said he felt there was something holy about her. A rich source for further examples of life-affirming individuals who also support Frankl's theory can be found in the Soviet Gulag. Among such examples was the poet Irina Ratushinskaya. Ratushinskaya was determined that the fortitude she witnessed in the Gulag should not be lost to posterity. In her poem, I Will Live and Survive, she wrote, and I will tell of the best people in all the earth, the most tender, but also the most invincible. This poem was written in November 1983, after seven months in prison, where she was beaten and put in solitary confinement in freezing conditions until many thought she would die from her injuries. Her remarkable memoir, Grey is the Color of Hope, describes her years in the small zone, a special unit for women political prisoners within the Barashova labor camp in Mordovia. Here, despite near starvation rations and the regular spells in the prison isolation cell where prisoners could only well, uh, wear a very small, thin, thin smock of some sort, these women still put others first, supported one another, shared any extra food they received, and refused to compromise their principles. Frequently, they even went on hunger strike if one of their number was put in the isolation cell or refused the regulation annual family visit. Family visit. Ratushinska writes, probably this is the best way to retain one's humanity in the camps to care more about another's pain than about your own. The women did not respond rudely to the insolence of the prison warders. They simply refused to speak. They were careful to avoid hating their persecutors and tried to laugh instead. Out of their bleak, inhuman environment, they created a garden growing nettles and anything that would add something nutritious to their appalling diet. Irina Ratushinska was born in 1954 and lived in Odessa, Ukraine. She graduated from Odessa University in 1976 with a degree in physics. As a student, she discovered the poetry of the great 20th century Russian poets, Akhmatova, Mandelstam, Pasternak, and Sitaeva, and became an active dissident. In November 1979, she married Igor Girashenko and moved to Kiev. Accused of manufacturing and disseminating religious poetry, which was defined according to the Soviet criminal code as anti-Soviet agitation and propaganda, she was arrested in 1982, aged 28, and sentenced in March 1983 to seven years in strict regime labor camps with a subsequent, subsequent five years 
of internal exile, the maximum punishment possible under Article 70 of the Soviet Criminal Code. Soviet reality and the labor camp environment were based on a construct of lies in which the aim of the authorities was to turn people into slaves or even to drive a person insane. Isaiah Berlin, during just a short visit to the USSR in 1956, felt the Soviet world was divorced from normality. He wrote, if one stays in the USSR more than two weeks, one's perspective and values are fatally transformed. To leave is like waking from a dream. There is no bridge with reality. For someone like Ratushinsko, who faced years in prison, the Soviet reality could have been a real threat to her sanity. And she admitted this. It seemed to me, she wrote, that the normal human world no longer existed and that I was living in a huge mental asylum. In a BBC broadcast in 1987, she explained, when prisoners are held in a camp or punishment cell, one of the KGB's main aims is to reduce them to a state where they lose all human dignity. To achieve this, they place people in conditions which are inconceivable, incomprehensible to the rational mind. Sometimes the prisoner's psychological defense mechanism is to retreat into madness. People try to substitute an imaginary reality for the horror which their mind can no longer bear. This is more a threat to creative people and I knew that I faced that risk. But I always hoped that I had sufficient resilience to withstand the reality of the KGB's making and hold on to my sanity. On a number of occasions, Ratyushinska went on hunger strike. And for this, a prisoner would get 15 days in the isolation cell. There was, of course, no heating and you had to wear very thin clothes. During one such spell, she felt extremely ill and was saved only because Tatyana Velikanova, one of the leaders of the Soviet human rights movement in the, in, in the USSR, was in the cell with her and shouted for a doctor. Ratushinska writes, I lay flush up against the heating pipes, but to no avail because they were cold. I fell into a delirious fever. In that delirium, I kept feeling that I was being drawn into the shapeless stain on one of the walls and clutched at the pipe to avoid being sucked into that dark patch. Ratushinska's resilience was extraordinary, strengthened by her religious faith, and, as she later acknowledged, by the prayers and support of many organizations and individuals who publicized her situation and campaigned for her release. As a young person before her imprisonment, she loved aeroplanes and she dreamt of flying one. And she continued to fly in her imagination and was thus able to preserve a sense of inner freedom during her imprisonment. Indeed, she likened to flying a particular sort of strength that she experienced. I quote her. The security which I felt in the labor camp of knowing that they could only kill my body with torture, nothing more, was something which I'd understood theoretically before. But it was another thing to learn that this was actually true it produced a special kind of strength, like imagining yourself flying, then suddenly finding that you are. Her attitude to other human beings, even to the criminals who were imprisoned with her, was always positive. 
affirming that, in her words, there is something else to them as well, and that I will never forget. I shall try to appeal to that something else which exists in even the most hardened criminal and, the, and even in the guards. She believed that hatred should be expunged from within yourself, as, in her words, it will flourish and spread during your years in the camps, driving out everything else, and ultimately it will corrode and warp your soul. Most of all among the women in the small zone, she admired Tatiana Velikanova, who established the honorable practices of dignity and care for others in the zone. The two women would have lengthy debates about what constitutes a human being to prevent themselves losing touch with the normal human world and treasured above all the warmth of the friendship that grew between them and the others in the small zone. On returning from a spell in the camp's filthy, icy hospital, Ratoshinsky recorded, I already feel much better within these walls, but even better than the walls of this, our home, is our friendship. This attitude to other human beings flowed from her Christian faith, which she discovered early on in her life in Odessa. She wrote warmly about her fellow prisoner, a Lithuanian school teacher, the teacher Jadwiga Bieloskene, whose Catholicism was the cornerstone of her existence. Like her, Ratushinska was not interested in denominational differences. As she said, wrote, God is one, after all, and it is to him that we shall all come in the end. Another fellow prisoner, Galina Barats Kochen, after working as a Moscow University lecturer on Marxism, had become a Pentecostal. In her words to her husband, she called her husband her hum hunger strike a fast and commented, and commented Ratushinska, um, she would depend only on water and prayer to sustain her. Ratushinska then writes, what a mixed bunch we are, a Catholic, a Pentecostal, several Orthodox, an unbeliever. Later, we were to be joined by a Baptist, yet, we were always deeply respectful of one another's convictions. And God did not turn his face away from our small patch of Mordovian soil. When another woman prisoner in the small zone, Natalia Lazarevia, had two cardiac arrests in the isolation cell, Ratushinskaya prayed that she might live and although desperately weak herself um, from a hunger strike, when Natalia cried out in pain, Ratushinskaya mysteriously found within herself enough strength to reach her on the other side of the cell. She writes, from what reserves? I don't know. Strange things happen when you have nothing to depend on except God's help. During another spell in the punishment cell, some of the women sang hymns and psalms. And one Christmas Eve, when back in the small zone, they gathered around a table, said the Lord's Prayer, while Bieliskiene divided up a communion wafer from Lithuania that had been sent in an envelope by one of her relations. And Ratushinska writes, and we, despite our various creeds, never doubted for a moment that God was looking down on us all at that moment. After her release from prison and her arrival in Britain in December 1986, Ratushinska was interviewed by Keston's staff. She explained that in a labor camp, the authorities aimed to break you spiritually, and she recounted a mysterious experience of warmth in the punishment cell. She writes, while I was still in the camp, we all, my fellow prisoners and I, 
were frequently aware, actually physically aware, of the support of prayer. It is very hard to explain. It sounds very mystical. But we all, at varying times, felt what could be described as an active flow of strength, a sort of warmth, and bearing in mind the icy conditions of punishment cells, this warmth could only have been the force of prayer, sustaining and protecting us. Ratushinskaya's Christian faith often comes clearly through her poetry. In her poem, I Will Live and Survive, she testifies to experiencing a second birth and describes an epiphany in her cell brought about by a frost-covered window. In the midst of what has, had, was meant to destroy her, destroy her, she had acquired a level of perception that transfigured her surroundings and gave her the strength to survive. In January 1984, she wrote the poem, I Talk to the Mice and to the Stars. In this poem, she becomes aware that her poetic gift is a divine calling. Echoing Pushkin's poem, The Prophet, her mouth is touched by a six-winged seraphim. She proudly wears the marks of the rank awarded to her by a divine hand and Christ-like is prepared to drink the cup that is presented to her. In the midst of death-dealing reality, she transforms the horror into something life-giving and beautiful. While imprisoned, Ratushinska sometimes managed to write down her poems on four centimeter wide strips of cigarette paper which were then tightly rolled into a small tube, less than the thickness of your little finger, she writes, that were sealed and made moisture-proof by a method of Ratuchinskaya's own devising. These capsules were then secreted out of the prison when an opportunity presented itself. She would write poetry in her head while sewing gloves on sewing machines that made a racket like machine guns. She writes, after arriving at the final ver version of five or six lines, I jot them down on a bit of paper which is concealed under a pile of unsewn gloves. When the poem is complete, I commit it to memory and burn the paper. Her poetry was much in demand in the small zone and even by the non-politicals in the main part of the camp. A thief called Vasya, who because of his uh, TB had been sent to the prison hospital, jumped over a fence into the small zone one day and was fascinated by the uncompromising moral standards of Ratushinskaya and the other women. He asked her to write down some of her poetry and there ensued a correspondence between the small zone and some of the thieves who through their contacts and the use of bribes managed to get letters from Ratuchinska out to her husband until the warders carried out a detailed search and moved the women to, a different, uh, to different quarters. While in the punishment cell, Ratuchinska would recite her poems to those in the neighboring cell, speaking into a mug by a pipe that running along the wall would help carry the sound. She described how prisoners demanded more and more poetry, how she began to tire, but, she writes, I was filled with new strength, which came from some source I did not know I possessed. Thanks to an international campaign, Ratushinska was eventually rele released in October 1986, and soon thereafter allowed to come to Britain. Keston played a key role in this campaign, as Alyona Kajevnikova, who was editor of the Keston News Service, and translated Ratushinska's memoir, Grey is the Color of Hope, uh, she testified to this fact of our involvement. 
of the numerous prisoners of conscience brought to the attention of the global media by Keston, the case of Ratushinsky had the most successful outcome. Kazhevnikova stated, public attention is notoriously fickle, but the case of this young woman roused the sympathy and concern of people from all walks of life around the world. Demonstrations were held, petitions were signed, and the clamor refused to die down until four years later, Gorbachev, descending from his plane for a summit meeting with US President Reagan in uh, Reykjavik, announced immediately that he would not be answering any questions about Ratushinskaya as she has already been released. In the words of Irina's husband, Igor Gerashenka, Keston played the most decisive role in the campaign because it kept the international media constantly up to date with her situation. Many organizations such as Penn International and Amnesty International joined the campaign in support of Ratushinskaya, but it was the work of Keston that attracted the most attention. During the last four months before Ratushinskaya's release, Keston, through Alyona Kazhevdikova, was lucky enough to establish telephone contact with her husband in Kiev. This regular contact enabled Keston to inform the world about exactly what was happening to her. Alyona Kazhevnikova recorded, This was not without its humorous moments. It was decided that I, as a native speaker, would phone Igor. He had no way of knowing who I was, nor was I certain that he was at the other end of the line, or some KGB functionary responding to that number. I started reciting one of Irina's poems, then broke off and said I couldn't remember the next line. Igor promptly continued, filled in the lines of the, of the verse. After we'd played this game four or five times, we were both satisfied that we were who we claimed to be. We still laugh about it. In December 1986, two months after her release, Ratushinska rang Keston and told Alyona that she was about to board a flight to London's Heathrow Airport. Keston's staff turned out in force to meet them. And although both Ratushinska and her husband were very tired, they agreed to a short appearance at the airport's press center, which was packed with journalists, photographers, and television cameras. A regular press, press conference was organized the next day, during which Ratushinska made a short speech. Ladies and gentlemen, she said, soon we shall be all <coughs> celebrating Christmas in the warmth of our homes. But at the same time, the best people of our country will spend their Christmas in camps, prisons, and punishment cells. They are prisoners of conscience. Let us not forget them. Shortly after Ratushinska's arrival in London, she and her husband were received by Margaret Thatcher at no number 10 Downing Street and met numerous other prominent political and religious figures. In 1987, she was invited to spend a year as poet in residence at Northwestern University in, here in the US, and afterwards returned to England. Several years later, thanks to excellent medical care in the West, after the appalling physical suffering of her time in the Gulag, Ratushinska gave birth to twin boys, Sergei and Alyek. She and her husband never intended to emigrate, permanently, but as they were stripped of their Soviet citizenship, they were not able to return to the USSR. They eventually, however, received uh, pass Russian passports in 1998 during Yeltsin's period in power. And when the twins were school age, the family settled in Moscow. Uh, Ratushinska wanted her boys to, to grow up in uh, her own culture. And she died in 2017. 
During an interview with Keston staff in early 1987, Ratushinskaya expressed deep gratitude to all those who'd taken part in the campaign for her release and dedicated to, her, to them the following poem. Believe me, it was often thus in solitary cells on winter nights, a sudden sense of joy and warmth and a resounding note of love. And then, unsleeping, I would know, a huddled by an icy wall, someone is thinking of me now, petitioning the Lord for me. My dear ones, thank you all, who did not falter, who believed in us. In the most fearful prison hour, we probably would not have passed through everything from start to end. Our he heads held high, unbowed, without your valiant hearts to light our path. There are many valiant hearts today in Ukraine. May they know that while they are a huddled by an icy wall. We are thinking of them, indeed praying for them. It was not long after Ratushinsky's release in, in, in 1986 that the Ber Berlin War fell and that the communist system eventually collapsed. I hope and pray that the Putin regime will disintegrate and that peace at last will be negotiated so that Ukraine's long agony may be brought to an end. Thank you. Thank you for that very powerful lecture. Now we have an opportunity, if you'll come back up and agree to uh, answer some, right. some questions. Okay, does anybody have a question? If not, I'll ask the first one. Anybody? Oh, Patrick, of course, is gonna come through for us. I was curious um, what, did Irina maintain contact with her former uh, cellmates? And what was, what was her relationship with them after she was able to escape, or to be, after she was released? Well, I think once she'd come to, to Britain, I think communication with members of the dissident movement would have been nearby, near impossible, I think. Um, and it, it could have caused problems, I guess. But of course, the dissident movement was being constantly um, attacked. I mean, it's the most remarkable phenomenon, I think, of the Soviet period, the one that I find particularly interesting. I, 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 yeah, I don't know whether she was able to communicate with them, honestly. I imagine... Uh, and of course, by, by the time she came out, this was already, of course, Perestroika. Um, and as I said, she got her Russian passport uh, under Yeltsin. So she must have been able to communicate, I would have thought, after from... The big change in party policy was 1988, when they changed their policy on religion. So I would have thought from then on she would have been able to communicate. But I think probably Alyona Kozhevnikova is someone I'd need to ask about that, because they were very, very close to each other. And, of course, Alyona translated so much of her work. And, and there is some evidence in her, some of her writings later that there were a couple, but a number of those women did not survive. Sadly, yeah, uh, some of them were in very poor health, and she does mention that in some of her writings. Yes, I, I mean Tatiana Vilikanova was obviously one of her great friends. Right. I don't know what the date of her death was, yeah. but she, and she was also you think about her age at the time, so she was one of the younger of those who were imprisoned. Mm. Uh, I do highly recommend uh, "Gray is the Color of Hope," yeah, uh, which has been translated and. Uh, it's a very powerful, powerful read. Other questions? Uh, 
Uh, what oh, what uh, has happened with her children, her sons? What? Is Interesting question, because Aliona um, kept in close touch with Ratushinska, um, and, and indeed, I think, saw her very shortly before her death. Uh, interesting, both boys have been called up. One is going to fight. The other, no, he says, I shall go to a top lawyer and, um, you know, defend my refusal to fight in the courts. But I don't know the outcome of that. Fight for which? Oh, well, Russia. I mean, they're, they're based in Moscow, you see. Okay. Yeah, because uh, Irina, when she got her Russian passport, um, she didn't go to live in Odessa. She and Igor Gerashenko and the boys went to live in Moscow, which is actually I, where I met her, because there's a, a, an English composer who composed something using Irina's poetry. And at Michael Bordeaux's request, I took a CD with that music and visited Irina in her apartment, met the two boys, and uh, yeah, lovely lads they were, but the heart sinks at the thought of one, you know, going to, to war. Yeah, so yeah, on the Russian side, yeah. So that dissidence continues in that next generation. Well, yes, it's interesting, and two boys, twins, having completely different positions. Nadezhda Mandelstam writes in her book, Hope Against Hope, her great memoir, that the most dangerous people in a totalitarian state are the poets. And their poets are usually the first arrested. Would you care to elaborate on that statement and also what was there specifically about uh, Ratushinskaya that led to her arrest for writing poetry? I assume it was the religious nature of her poetry. This was seen as anti-Soviet propaganda. I suppose poetry reaches to the depths of a human being. It, it, it can convince you of certain beliefs and values more than prose. And I think it's something that you can memorize, you can hold in your memory, you carry with you. Um, you're quite right. I mean, Ahmadova, Pasternak, all those the great poets, yes, they were... But, but, but I think actually many Soviet writers too were thought of as, as highly. Mikhail Bulgakov, I know you're, that's the author you're interested in, yes. I, th I think it must be the nature of poetry and it gets repeated and, and memorized and passed from one person to another. It touches you more deeply. I don't know, do you have a, <laughs> a view of that? What could the, the reason be? I think you're quite right. I think it touches the human heart. Mm. So Mm. in ways that uh, pros can't, can't manage so quite do it, yeah, yeah. But uh. generally, as Michael Stahm says, it's the poets who are considered the most dangerous. Extraordinary, yes, actually it was uh, Larissa, Larissa, we were just talking, like, she said, why should a poet get put in prison? And I said, I think it was the religious content, I think that it was seen as a terrible threat to the, the uh, Marxist-Leninist ideology upon which the system was based. I mean, that was the the raison d'etre for all the persecution of religious believers. And of course, why Keston was created. <laughs> but it does seem very, very mad to us, doesn't it? Uh, just, just another comment on that question, Wallace. Uh, when I was in Moscow back in 1980, the first time, uh, when you'd go to the Lenin Library, and if you wanted to make a, a photocopy of something or, or, or a, 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 have something microfilmed, uh, some of there are others here who had that experience that you were assigned to a particular reading room a certain day of the week and a certain hour of the day you would go to this office fill out some forms to apply to have a photocopy made of something and you would stand in a line at what was sort of like a teller's desk at an old bank and uh, push the materials under through a little window and a woman sitting there would look at the materials and decide whether you could have the photocopy. On the wall in front of her was a, was a page of, of reasons not to allow you to have a copy of this thing. And on that list, there were things like if, if on the inside back uh, of, the, of the book, if it said, uh, yes, plot, no, um, free, uh, you know, 
they would not let you have a photocopy because if this was being distributed without uh, without price, maybe it's sort of like a uh, a government document here that was distributed to people uh, uh, rather than being sold in stores. And so for the woman sitting at the desk, this was a signal that maybe we should not allow you to have it, or if it was printed in a small tirage, a small, uh, if only 300 copies were, were printed in the first place, they would not let you have a photocopy. But another reason that they would not let you have a photocopy is if it contained poetry. Uh, because again, these women sitting at the desk should not be making decisions about those those deeper meanings of poetry and deciding whether you could have it or not. The Lenin Library is an interesting place because it has what's the Spetskran, the special place for, for banned books, really. And I know after Perestroika, a friend I was talking to, he said, oh, you know, in Soviet days, I could actually, I had a friend in a Spetskran, and I could get all the religious literature I wanted. I used to go and get it there, and this was, you know, during the bad old Soviet days. So, strangely enough, there were ways and means of getting hold of banned literature. Okay, another question. Then, okay, one more. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. How did Irina and whether uh, did Irina affect you somehow in your life? Well, I think it's this extraordinary, the ability to survive these conditions and not to be destroyed by it and to be an example of, of extraordinary heroism. And I, I think I'm particularly moved by her witness to the support and the effect of people's prayers in the West. And I know this actually from um, uh, other um, Russian, um, I'm thinking of um, Alexander Agarodnikov, who I know per personally. He, t he had this experience. He was actually near despair, again, in the punishment cell, and he wanted to commit suicide. And he, he told me this fact. That he had this extraordinary physical sense of warmth, and it altered his, his dis took his despair away. I think those, those, her, those stories, for me, are profoundly important. Um, and then her, the actual quality of her poetry, too. Um, and this lovely way of reflecting Push, Pushkin's poem, The Prophet, you know, having the, the coal put on her mouth and being um, you know, given this, this special gift of, of poetry. Uh, no, I think as a human being, as a poet, yeah, extraordinary woman, wonderful, wonderful, inspiring person. Mm. Thank you so much. And now I would ask our Dean, Jeffrey Archer, to come and make a statement. Good afternoon. It's so great to see how many people are here, and it's wonderful to hear you talk about people surviving persecution. And we're sitting here at Baylor University, a place that looks to prepare men and women for worldwide service and for academic excellence. And it's worldwide service are taking our people places where they may experience persecution. What better place for the Keston Center to be than at Baylor, preparing men and women for worldwide service. And that we know that our God is still the same God that was in Acts, where we saw persecution. It's still the same God that's with us now. And we have an opportunity through resources like the Keston Center and those collections to, to, for the, to bear witness to what people will continue to experience. And that's important for us in, our, in a place where it's rather easy for us, for the most part, to express our Christian faith. And it's not the case elsewhere. That being said, I would like to acknowledge 
the Keston Institute of the United Kingdom and the New Denon, and the work that Kathy uh, Hillman did to help facilitate, because facilitating these things are not easy, the establishment of the Keston Center for Religion, Politics, and Society Endowed Excellence Fund. So it's more than just abstract, that there's this additional commitment, not only to trust in trusting the stewardship of the resources and the collections that were brought over, but further investing in that, because I, I do just want to read the purpose to help set the context. The Keston Center for Religion, Politics, and Society Endowed Excellence Fund shall be, permanent, shall be a permanent endowment. Funds distributed from the endowment shall be used at the discretion of the director of the Keston Center to further the center's mission and support students, faculty, scholars, and researchers from Baylor and across the world. Use, uses of this fund may include, but are not limited to, Research, lectures, conferences, travel, pre preservation, archiving, processing, digitization, exhibits, renovation, and other priorities, uh, other priority needs as determined by the director of the Keston Center for the Religion, for Keston Center for Religion, Politics, and Society. So how much does it take to establish an endowment? Well, I would like to just quickly say that it wasn't a small amount, and the initial commitment was uh, 100,000 pounds. So this, I, again, I, we're, I think we're extremely honored and humbled by the entrusting of additional resources to help preserve this collection and to make sure that we bring more scholars and expose more students to these collections. Uh, so I just really want to acknowledge and thank the, the Keston Institute for establishing this. Thank you, Dean Archer. Thank you, Xenia. And thank you to the Keston Institute for this wonderful gift. And we do thank those who sponsored today's lecture. That's International Studies. Uh, Michael Long and the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures. English, Department of English, the Department of History, and the Department of Religion. And of course, the Baylor Libraries. Is anyone here from the Creative Arts Experience? If not, I know some of you need credit, and so you will you see the guy in the back raising, your hand, raising his hand. That's who you go and see. That's Carl Flynn, and with him is Troy Shaw, and we thank them for making the webinar and the recording possible. So if you want to watch this again, it will be available. After I close, please enjoy refreshments and conversation with Xenia and others. You may also want to watch an additional video interview that includes both Keston founder Michael Bordeaux and Irina Ratishinskaya. I close by reading the headlines on the Washington Post obituary in July 2017 that states as the headline, Irina Ratishinskaya, a Soviet dissident who turned captivity into poetry, dies at 63. Today, her resurrected words offer hope to the people of her homeland and to us. Stars cascade from the zenith and cold fills the heavens' dominion. As a crescent moon rises, hold on without loosening your grip. I'm walking that road with my shoulder beneath the Lord's hand. You are dismissed for refreshments and conversation. Thank you.